Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me for this webinar, Prevent an Event, The Last Heart Attack. And we're going to go through why we have heart attacks and what we can do to evaluate our risk and prevent these events. Now, uh, I work at Expanding Choices. This is an integrative healthcare clinic here in Albuquerque. And here's uh, some of our information here with phone number, email, and I will reiterate this again at the end of this webinar, but if you have any questions, any concerns, anything you wanna ask us, any information you would like to get from us, please give us a call or send us an email and we'll be happy to get this out to you. Okay, I will uh, put this slide up again at the end of this webinar. Now, I'd like to begin uh, Henry Allen Avai, affectionately called Papa Avai, was a teacher of mine and my wife's in Hawaii. He was a po'okele la'au lapa'au, and he was a, basically a master herbalist uh, in traditional Hawaiian medicine. And he worked, he lived on the big island, but he was, uh, would work on all the islands and was actually seeing patients up uh, until he was 95 years old. And I always remember what he said about the heart and cardiovascular disease. He said, this is very difficult to treat because no one wants to believe their heart is sick. And this is very true, I found in uh, my practice. I have many patients who may be in their 60s or 70s and we asked him to do some uh, testing to look for cardiovascular disease. And they say, well, my heart is fine. And we know that part of the aging process is cardiovascular disease. So I always keep this in mind when I'm seeing patients that he said, no one wants to believe their heart is sick. And I'd like you to keep this in mind too, as we go along. I want to just start out by showing this uh, short animation on what is a heart attack so we can all be roughly on the same page. Heart attack happens when blood flow to part of the heart muscle is blocked. The blockage harms part of the heart muscle because it is no longer getting oxygen from the blood. Most heart attacks are caused by a blood clot that blocks one of the coronary arteries. Occasionally, a heart attack can be caused by a spasm or tightening of a coronary artery. Coronary arteries are the blood vessels that supply oxygen-rich blood to the heart muscle. In coronary artery disease, the inside of the coronary arteries narrow and harden because of the buildup of fatty material called plaque. Blood flow to the heart muscle is decreased. If the plaque cracks or breaks open, a blood clot can form on the surface of the plaque. The clot, also called a thrombus, can completely block blood flow in the artery. Once the, the flow of blood is blocked, a heart attack will happen when a part of the heart muscle becomes damaged. The heart may not be able to pump blood throughout the body very well. This can cause chest, arm, back, or jaw discomfort or pain, shortness of breath, or other symptoms. After a heart attack, if the blockage is not treated and removed within a few hours, the damaged heart muscle will begin to die and be replaced by scar tissue. This heart damage may not be obvious or may cause severe and long-lasting symptoms because the heart cannot pump blood well. Another less common cause of a heart attack is a severe spasm or tightening of a coronary artery that cuts off blood flow to the heart muscle. Spasms can occur in people with or without coronary artery disease. Just as clots may do, spasms can completely block blood flow in the artery. Once the flow of blood is blocked, a heart attack will happen when a part of the heart muscle becomes damaged. The heart may not be able to pump blood throughout the body very well. This can cause chest, 
arm, back, or jaw discomfort or pain, shortness of breath, or other symptoms. After a heart attack, if the blockage is not treated and removed within a few hours, the damaged heart muscle will begin to die and be replaced by scar tissue. This heart damage may not be obvious or may cause severe and long lasting symptoms because the heart cannot pump blood well. Okay, so what I'd like you to get out of that is it's possible to have a heart attack even though there is no cardiovascular disease present. And we're going to look at that as we go further along here. Now, we're all about preventing an event. And we know from major institutions like the Cleveland Clinic, it'll say 80 to 90% of heart attacks are preventable. And 50% of strokes are preventable. So we have to ask ourselves, number one, why is this not happening? And two, how is it that we can go about preventing these events? Now, I want to first look at the heart here. And the heart really is a conductor of this symphony, not the brain, as we often think. And the heart really has the innate wisdom to control the rest of our organ systems here. And that is why we're really focusing on the heart. Now, it's important to understand the heart rules. And a famous individual a long time ago said, educating the mind without the heart is no education at all. And truer words have never been spoken. So how can we educate the heart? Now, the heart, there's an electromagnetic field that our body creates. And the heart is the most powerful. In fact, every time your heart beats, it generates two and a half watts of electricity. And as we said, it is the master conductor where the entire body is synchronized around the heart. Now the heart is the first organ to develop and the electromagnetic field of the heart radiates 15 feet outside the body. You may often wonder uh, when you're in the presence of someone, particularly someone very wise and we'll say a, this great person, you can often feel that. And the same if you're in the presence of a lot of negativity, you can actually feel that, but you can affect others with your electromagnetic field. Now, the heart is autogenic. It has its own intrinsic nervous system. As you see here, if we just take it outside the body and put it in a sustainable fluid, it can go on beating, right? It's an encoding and processing center and it is independent of the brain. And we often don't think of that because we think it is the brain as the master conductor and controlling things, but it's actually the heart. And the heart is the most powerful generator of rhythmic information patterns. Uh, this can include neurological, hormonal, electromagnetic pressure data to the brain and to the rest of the body. Now, as I said, it is the conductor. Harmonious ordered function requires both cognitive and mental clarity and emotional balance. And to have that, we need the heart working at its optimum. Okay, now, just look at this little uh, bit of a circle here, we think, and it goes both ways. So every thought, attitude, and emotion, and we can think of, and we'll look at some positive thoughts and negative emotions. They all have a physiological consequence in our body, and they influence our behavior, same way as our behavior influences our thought and emotion, our behavior influences physiological consequences in our body. So what we want to do is have this to be positive. So our heart as a master conductor is conducting the symphony in an ordered fashion. Now, coherence is thought of as harmony. This is the quality of being logically integrated, consistent and intelligible. Okay. So we have relations among parts of a system 
or multiple systems. And just think of our body, the multiple organ systems, right? And the heart, they're going to organize around the heart. So our heart has this profound impact on emotional balance, clarity, creativity, health, performance, quality of life, and whether or not we have an event such as a heart attack or stroke. And in Hawaiian medicine, this would be called pono. So we would like to be coherent, harmonious, or pono. Now, if we look at stress, uh, Hans Selye once said, there are no stressful situations, only stressful reactions. So no matter what our environment is around us, and it may be an environment that is very conducive to act out in a stressful way, but it is not the environment that's stressful, it's how we react to it. And this can have profound effects on our heart, our brain, our autonomic nervous system. And this is basically our gas pedal and brake, our fight or flight, and our rest and digest, our immune system, our hormonal system. Now we can look at the effects of stress with heart rate variability and heart rhythms. And these are simple things we, we do in the office here, and even you can do at home. And here's a little graph from, uh, you see in the bottom right there, HeartMath. You could go to heartmath.com and look at the site. Uh, I'm a big advocate of HeartMath to help uh, synchronize our system. Now, you can see here in the graphs, emotions are reflected in heart rhythm patterns. And on the top is frustration, and it, it looks like frustration. And on the bottom is appreciation, and it's very ordered and rhythmic. And that's where we want to be to help us prevent an event. Now, if we look at emotions, positive and negative emotions, that are triggering the change, our emotions will trigger the change in this autonomic nervous system, or what we said was our gas pedal and brake pedal. Now, positive emotions such as appreciation, caring, compassion, love, joy, peace, these produce these coherent heart rhythms and they help to synchronize the system. Whereas negative emotions such as frustration, anger, anxiety, worry, we get this highly variable erratic pattern and it's an incoherent heart rhythm and it produces a lot of disorder in our system. And you can think of uh, situations every day for all of us. Uh, we're driving and someone cuts us off. So we may want to act out with a lot of anger or frustrated. We want to get back. This is going to produce incoherent heart rhythm and put increased stress on our heart. Or we could act out more in a realm of compassion. We don't know what's going on with this individual sort of send along good energy, and we can help ourselves out with more coherent heart rhythm patterns. So it's really up to us how we react to our environment, and how we react is going to have a lot to do with our heart. Now, I just want to show you this example called broken heart syndrome. And if you remember from the animation, it's certainly possible that very clean heart arteries with no uh, coronary vascular disease, no disease in our vascular system, and still have a heart attack. This is called broken heart syndrome. It's actually a real syndrome, uh, also called, you see on the right there, Takasubo. And this is a catecholamine, or just think adrenaline, adrenaline-induced transient myocardial or heart, a stunning of the heart muscle, okay? Now, this happens from stress. So with stress, we get this sympathetic nervous system. This is the gas pedal or fight or flight system. So we may have this sudden outburst of anger, rage, frustration. We get this outpouring of adrenaline from our sympathetic nervous system and this can lead to a stunning of the heart muscle, even heart failure, angina or chest pain, coronary spasm. And if this lasts long enough, we could actually have a heart attack. Most of these occur in women. What's interesting in, in just the 
within the last month, I've seen two women who actually on their blood chemistry are shown to have damage to their heart. Now they have no known instance of a heart attack or never presented to the emergency room. They do relate extremely high stress. And you know, we, we do further workup on them, but they've actually had damage to their heart muscle that uh, we could, as best we can tell, relate to a situation just like this. Now, is stress really a factor in heart disease? Let's take a look at this very short video. We know that there is a link between emotion, particularly emotional stress and heart disease. And some of the best evidence comes from the first Gulf War when the people of Israel were under Scud missile attacks, there was a big spike in the rate of heart attacks. More people had heart attacks during those Scud missile attacks. We think the mechanism is that the stress, the anxiety, increased heart rate and blood pressure and led to plaques in the coronary arteries rupturing and causing a blood clot to form, which is the major cause of heart attacks. That's an important lesson for patients with heart disease. If you have heart disease or if you're at high risk for heart disease, it's a good idea to try to do stress management. If you can lower your levels of stress, you may lower your risk of having a heart attack. And we know one thing that lowers stress, and that's regular physical activity. That's just one more reason to exercise. Regular exercise is good for the heart, lowers stress, and may lower your risk of heart attack. There you have it, talking about stress leading to vascular injury and plaque formation and subsequently plaque rupture, all from stress. Now, let's look at some things that we can do, non-invasive testing, and then look at uh, some treatment options. So we know how important the heart is. It is the master conductor. And we know for most, most of us, we don't ever want to think that our heart may be sick, but statistics would tell us otherwise. And if we look at America, undetected cardiovascular disease is the greatest risk facing patients today, undetected. We have the tools to detect it early, but that uh, rarely happens. It's 80 million or more Americans have some disease, and the primary symptom of heart disease is death. Now, cardiovascular disease is actually reversible. We can do, use diet and lifestyle changes, nutritional supplementation, exercise, we talked about stress reduction. We can actually stabilize it and reverse it. Now, if we look at women, I've often uh, thought uh, women in our country are constantly bombarded. I got to check for breast cancer. I got to get uh, my screening for breast cancer every year. When we look at statistics for every woman dying from breast cancer, eight will die from a heart attack. And more recent statistics puts this up to almost 10 women will die of a heart attack for everyone who dies from breast cancer. After the age of 45, the percentage of women with high blood pressure is equal to that of men. And after the age of 64, more women have high blood pressure than men. And every year, 55,000 more women than men have strokes. So in many respects, we can say, certainly after menopause, uh, a lot of this cardiovascular disease is primarily a woman's disease. So if we need any more statistics, you know, we talk, it's almost one in three Americans have some cardiovascular disease and more recent statistics say almost one in two. There's a coronary event or heart attack every 25 seconds. There's, you know, almost a, a million deaths per year from cardiovascular disease. And we can read on and on the amount of strokes and goes on to the enormous cost of this. And I think when people think of cardiovascular disease, they think of cholesterol, but we know half of people with coronary vascular disease events, again, heart attacks and strokes, they have normal cholesterol levels. So just as many people have so-called normal cholesterol levels, 
as those who have abnormal. And it's really uh, not the cholesterol that is the big issue here. So we say, what can we do? We see the statistics. It happens every day, many, many times a day throughout this country. What can we do? And really, there's a number of things that one can do. It's very simple. Uh, they could do this once a year. We have what we call a prevent and event screening. Uh, doing comprehensive blood chemistry testing, some of the non-invasive testing, HeartSmart IMT Plus. We're going to talk about that. Uh, then uh, certainly this different types of stress reduction that we encourage people to engage in every day. And then we talk about lifestyle issues, particularly diet, physical activity, et cetera. So as we go through, I want you to remember this. Inflammation plus plaque, particularly soft plaque, and we'll talk about the difference between soft and hard, but inflammation plus plaque is a coronary vascular event. Okay? Inflammation plus plaque. You should know, one, am I inflamed? Two, do I have plaque? If I do, what type of plaque it is? And people who have plaque and inflammation are at very high risk. Now, I want to uh, bring out a case here you may have heard of years ago. It was in 2008. Tim Russert, who was the uh, NBC News correspondent for Meet the Press at the time. Some of you may have seen him on television. He was 58 years old. He was taking blood pressure medication, cholesterol medications, was regularly monitored by his cardiologist. Two weeks before his death, he, he passed a stress test. And he was told his chance of a heart attack in the next 10 years is 5%. Yet two weeks later, he died of a massive heart attack. You say, how could this be missed? Well, at autopsy, Mr. Russert was found to have soft plaque in his heart arteries. And on his uh, previous blood chemistry, he had very high triglycerides. It's a fat. It's our primary fat, triglycerides. And low HDL, and HDL is felt to be, for intents and purposes, we just call it the good cholesterol, even though all cholesterol is good. So he had high triglycerides and low HDL. That is synonymous with inflammation. So here's a gentleman who had soft plaque and inflammation. His risk was exceedingly high, and he needed to make changes from that moment on. Yet he was told his risk is very low and you just keep doing what you're doing. And so why wasn't this picked up? We have the necessary tools to find out about plaque and inflammation. What are these tools? Well, blood testing, a comprehensive chemistry blood panel. I've always told patients over the years, this is the single most cost-effective preventive measure if it's evaluated with functional lab values. So I often say it's not um, the blood test you get, it's who's looking at those blood tests, and you have to look at it with the right eyes. And what are functional versus standard lab values? Well, basically standard lab values, which if you've gotten blood tests, you see on the form, they'll say the reference range is here. This is just taking all comers, very sick people, people who are on kidney dialysis, people who've had two heart attacks, people with cancer. Um, and they just uh, put all these people together in a statistical pool and come out with the standard lab values. Whereas functional lab values have been done by people, and they are looking at people who are on no medications and, as best we know, have no known disease process. And all of a sudden, you see these values sort of shrink down and say, well, this is the range I want to be in. So we like to look at lab values with functional ranges. I tell people, get this test once a year. Now, some people who have uh, significant disease, they're highly inflamed or diabetic, we may test more often, but people we say at least once a year to get this. And the reason is objective findings, findings on a test like this are, are almost always gonna precede subjective findings, i.e. symptoms 
and a diagnosis. So you can pick up disease process processes at its earliest stages. Now, uh, and this is where you don't uh, have to remember all this, but we can send you this information if you let us know. Uh, you know, I'll put up again our phone number, our uh, email. You can let us know and we can send you this information. But here's some really key biomarkers on a blood chemistry panel. And these are very, very important. Now, I once asked a cardiologist here, he said, you know, a lot of these tests here, you'll see on the left that CRPHS we're going to look at, or I could go down homocysteine or uric acid, vitamin D. I said, I never see patients who go through the heart hospital in your clinic have these. And I said, all these tests have been studied. They've been written up in peer-reviewed journals. How come you don't get them? And this cardiologist told me that they just don't have time to go over them. And, well, I'll admit it takes a little bit of time, but uh, they are so critical because it clues you in on disease processes at its earliest, and you can uh, alter your lifestyle and treatment objectives so that you can reverse this cardiovascular disease and prevent an event. If we just wait until the event happens, I always say, once someone comes in with crushing chest pain, I, I hardly have to be a, an astute physician to realize there's a cardiovascular event going on. But if I look at someone's panel early on, you have to be rather astute to pick up early disease where it can actually be treated. Now, when we look at functional levels, I've, I've named the levels that we aspire to the Lombardi levels. Some of you may have remembered Vince Lombardi, a legendary football coach, but he said, perfection is not attainable. But if we chase perfection, we can catch excellence. And I challenge all my patients, we are on all these lab tests, we are chasing perfection. I tell them, every number on this panel tells a story. And, and when people, a new patient comes in to see me, I say, tell me your story. Sometimes I tell patients, go get this lab panel, and I'm going to tell you your story, because these numbers won't lie. Now, some key markers. These you should all have. These are routine easy to get. If you ever have problems getting them, you can either come into our clinic, and if you're, you don't live in Albuquerque, give us a call. We have a lot of patients out of state that we get uh, labs ordered on. This is your triglyceride and HDL, just what we talked about with Mr. Russert. If this is all I had on a patient, I could tell a lot about them. And we want our triglyceride divided by the HDL to be less than two, less than two. Now, these levels need to be obtained in a fasting state. Ideally, your absolute triglyceride levels under 100, and for your HDL, roughly for females over 50, males over 40, okay? And we want that ratio under two. That would tell me there's not a lot of inflammation present, and would also tell me this patient's probably not eating a lot of refined carbohydrates. Another critical marker, and if this is all I have, I can tell a lot, your fasting insulin level. I hope I can live to the day where we can actually check our insulin at home with a, a finger stick, just like we do our blood sugar. But right now you have to go to a lab to get this done. What's our Lombardi level? Well, we want our fasting insulin under five. Insulin is like oxygen and iron. If we don't have it, we're gonna die. But if we have too much, we're gonna die slowly. So we want our insulin low. And if you have your fasting insulin and your fasting glucose, you can multiply them together and divide it by the number 405 and that should be less than 1.8. This tells you if you're insulin resistant, where your cells are not listening to the insulin, 
and it lets us know you're intolerant of carbohydrates and should not be eating them. So fasting insulin, very critical marker. What else? CRP, that stands for C, reactive protein, and the HS stands for high sensitivity. Very common marker. You could walk into any doctor's office, they would know this, and you should obtain this. This is a better predictor of cardiovascular risk than cholesterol ever was. And our Lombardi level is less than 0.5. It's not a common thing I see, but we are, again, always aspiring to this. So the lower, the better. And we know if people have a CRP, high sensitivity, less than 0.5, Studies have shown us they have a 99% chance of being alive in 10 years. And as that CRP goes up, their odds of being alive in 10 years go down significantly. How about homocysteine? Uh, it's, it's very common. Most people, new people I see, have never had a homocysteine drawn, which is almost shocking to me. A um, gentleman wrote a book on this well over 20 years ago. It's been well-reviewed research, good data on this, and our Lombardi level would be less than six. Now, I don't see that often. I tell people that's still what we're aspiring to. Any result in the single digits is pretty good. So homocysteine is very toxic to have high. It increases our risk for a cardiovascular event, such as a heart attack and stroke, and also for Alzheimer's disease which is misspelled there. I must have had a little brain cramp there. But Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and cardiovascular events. And what do we need to keep homocysteine low? So folic acid, which is B9, vitamin B6, and B12. And these are rather common deficiencies in patients. Uh, I had someone in recently who was uh, semi-vegetarian and I've seen this many times in the past. They, you know, to get adequate source of these B vitamins, they're really from animal source products. And he had really high uh, homocysteine. And I said, uh, well, you're going to need a supplement with this. And there's some really good supplementation that can help to keep your homocysteine low. Now, we know if someone has cardiovascular disease present, which is not unusual in the baby boomer population, but they have a homocysteine that's less than six. They still have a 99% chance to be alive in 10 years. So it's incredibly protective to have your homocysteine low. You should check this every year and you should do the necessary steps, both from dietary management and from supplementation to help keep this low throughout your life. How about uric acid? always like to look at uric acid. Uh, it is a, certainly a marker of inflammation. High uric acid increases our cardiovascular heart attack risk. Most common reason we see now for high uric acid is fructose. And fructose is in everything. I tell people, you better look at labels. You better become cognizant of labels. I say in a typical grocery store, even in a, say, natural food store, 80% of the items are gonna have some sort of fructose and sugar in them. So our Lombardi levels you see there for women and uh, levels for men. Now, sometimes we see very elevated uric acid in people with gout, where they have uh, some joint pain, joint swelling. Classically, it's in the, the big toe, but not always. And what's interesting from a Western standpoint, they say people with very high uric acid should not eat these uh, foods that have what's called purines, P-U-R-I-N-E-S in them. These would be things like uh, organ meats, red meats, thing, uh, shellfish, things that are very high in my recommended food list. When we really look at the data, People with high uric acid often have trouble getting rid of uric acid, which is excreted mainly in the kidneys. Now, eating these purine proteins from red meat, shellfish, organ meats will not impede 
the kidney's excretion of uric acid, but what will the fructose and sugar? So it's really fructose and sugar, tell people you've got to get off that when the uric acid is high. Now I may say that even when the uric acid isn't high, but certainly with high uric acid, you need to get off this. How about omega-3? There's something of a controversy now, not, not necessarily for me, but people concerned with uh, toxicity in marine life. Now we know omega-3s are an essential nutrient. We, our bodies cannot manufacture this. We are either eating it in our food supply or supplementing with this. And particularly when you think of fish oil and seafood, the two there, the EPA and DHA. And if you look at a bottle of fish oil, that's what you'll see on there in the back, EPA, DHA. Uh, the EPA is very important, critical for heart health, and the DHA is needed for brain health. Now, we can look at our level, an omega-3 index. We've been doing this for a long time, recommending everyone at least once a year get this. It measures the omega-3 content in the red blood cell membrane. And I put that up there, red blood cell membrane, because that's where you want to look at it. Many labs will look at the omega-3 index in the blood or the serum. It does not uh, fit in with the research. It's a cheaper test, so there's a bigger profit margin for the lab, but it's not as good for you. And the lab that does it, you can see down there, uh, Omega Quant, right here, their lab in South Dakota, really originated this, and did a lot of the research. This goes back 25 years or more. And there's a ton of research. What's the Lombardi level? 8%. So you get a reading back. Commonly, we see 3 4% in people. Uh, you get an 8% or higher. We could look at a lot of uh, research on this, but here's one from the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2016. People with the highest levels of omega-3 have the lowest risk for a heart attack. Uh, people with the highest levels of omega-3 have a 90% risk reduction in sudden cardiac death. Now, sudden cardiac death is someone who has a, an event, heart attack and dies. They had no symptoms and no prior history of any problems, yet they died. That's about half or maybe a little more than half of all heart attack deaths. There's no symptoms. There's no history. So just because oftentimes they say, you know, I don't really have any symptoms at all. My heart seems fine. Uh, no history of a problem. Doesn't mean I'm, I'm protective. I should do the things I can to really see if I have heart disease and what I can do to reverse it. So... 8% or higher, we can get a 90% risk reduction. We have the lowest risk for heart attacks. And Omega Quant, we, we carry their uh, little kits. It's just a finger stick that you would do for uh, a blood sugar at home. And they have a, an Omega-3 index kit that's $50. Uh, you can certainly get them off the site Omega Quant. It's a little more expensive there. You can just call us if you'd like a kit. We'll be happy to ship one out to you. Or if you're around the area, come and pick one up. And then the Omega-3 Complete is a little, little more data. There's a lot of, for uh, anyone who is a little bit geeked out on, like myself, on these labs and whatnot, that's a great test. I just redid mine recently and uh, just takes days and weeks to go over it. But there's a lot of great information on there. So... I encourage people to do that, but if they want to spend a little less money, they can get their omega-3 index and see what is the percentage of this omega-3 fatty acid in their red blood cell membrane. Very important for preventing an event. So when I look at blood chemistry, it's basically an indicator light alerting us to a disease process, and we get an early warning. Tell people, think of it like your car's oil light indicator. Problem isn't the oil light. If it was, I just put tape over the oil light and so it doesn't bother me anymore. But the light is just telling me there's a problem with the engine oil. It's alerting me early on so I can bring it in and get it taken care of so I don't have a disaster. So I tell people avoiding a blood chemistry until you're having symptoms is like putting tape over the oil light. And don't do this. Get a great comprehensive blood chemistry once a year. 
Okay, so that's blood chemistry. Now we're going to look at another test, a carotid ultrasound, and in particular with HeartSmart, what's called HeartSmart IMT Plus technology. Now, blood chemistry is really about the inflammation and the fallout of disease. With HeartSmart IMT Plus, this is about plaque, and it's actually looking at the disease. Okay? So these are both critical. What did we say before? Inflammation with plaque, exceedingly risky, and you need to uh, get on your high horse and start making changes. Now, the HeartSmart IMT Plus, the science of this goes back to 1986 with uh, particularly some NASA scientists, uh, along with some others who were trying to see if they could prevent heart attacks, so think prevent an event, using ultrasound images of the astronaut's uh, blood flow patterns. Okay, so they studied this for two years, and they concluded that the ultrasound method was reliable and had a predictive value higher than angiography. And angiography would be sort of the gold standard. That's where they inject some dye uh, into your vein, circulates through your body, through your heart arteries, and they take pictures. So much more invasive tests, and it's not somewhat something you're going to keep doing regularly, whereas the ultrasound is very non-invasive, and it's easy to repeat this and follow up with this. So the ultrasound method had a higher predictive value than angiography for determining the likelihood of a serious cardiac event. So the science is there. It has been there. Now, I want to show you this uh, short video on the HeartSmart IMT Plus, exactly what it is. This is. We've been doing this in our office for about seven years now. We're the only uh, clinic here in New Mexico doing this. There's several clinics, uh, many clinics around uh, the country that do it, many uh, cardiology clinics. There was uh, at University of uh, California recently, there was a big study published on the HeartSmart IMT Plus from their preventive cardiology uh, service. So it is used throughout the, the country, and we've been using this seven years. So take a look at this, exactly what it is, and then we're going to talk about it. It's but there is a simple and quick test that could help you from becoming a medical statistic. Dr. Darren Clare is here with his patient, Brigida, and technician, Don, to use a non-invasive, state-of-the-art diagnostic tool. Welcome to you all. Thank you. And what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be doing an ultrasound of the carotid artery. The carotid artery is on both sides of the neck, a very important artery because it supplies blood to your brain. What we're going to talk about is ultrasound because ultrasounds of the carotid artery can measure intima media thickness as well as look for plaque. Those can, believe it or not, be an early sign of atherosclerosis, which is hardening of your arteries, which, believe it or not, if you see it up here in your neck and your carotid arteries, it can also exist in the arteries that supply your heart muscle, putting you at risk for heart disease. But, Dr. Claire, ultrasound's been around for a long time, so what's unique about this technology? This test, which is the HeartSmart IMT Plus, uh, with the Devo technology in it, just by doing this test in my office, which is safe, quick, uh, you know, totally painless, I can know with a 95% certainty if you have any plaque building up in your heart, what type it is and how severe it is. So, Don, why don't you start imaging Brigitte's carotid artery, and we'll look at some images and. So you're going to hear the phrase IMT, that's intima media thickness. It's basically the thickness of the arterial wall. You don't want it to be too thick because that can be a sign of your increased risk for stroke, heart attack, et cetera. So right now, we're working to get the image of her carotid artery and walk us through what we're seeing, Dr. Claire. Okay, I'd love to, Travis. Right here, you're seeing the carotid artery. We're looking in sort of through the side of a straw. You can see the intima, uh, this fine white line right there, uh, which again is the intima media is where uh, the thickening occurs, which leads to atherosclerosis uh, and in certain people leads to plaque formation. And the intima media are, are literally, that's what makes up your arterial wall. Now, we have some images of good arteries versus unhealthy arteries. 
show us what we're looking at. Okay, great. This right here is a, a healthy artery. The intima media is right here. It's a spine, inner fine white line. That's what we're measuring. That's where the correlation is. You can see this is a little thick, but very significantly where the red circle is, uh, this person not only has thickening, they also have a big nasty plaque sticking into the lumen of the artery. And so what people are looking at there is plaque in the carotid artery, which if it breaks off, it can actually go up to your brain and cause a stroke there as well. So that's right. one of the things that you've done is you've taken images from Brigitte and you've actually mapped them out. Give a letter grade. A is good, E is bad. And if you're in, the, in between there, you have to have some concern. Walk us through this chart. Okay, yeah. The way I like to look and think about it is just like your report card from school, okay? A is, is great. E, I say, go to the emergency room, okay? And A, Brigitte's was normal, right? Uh, Brigitte's is totally normal. And secondly, we measure the plaque character. Yeah, because there's not only, there's different types of plaque. There's the soft plaque and the hard plaque. A lot of cardiologists will now tell you that the soft plaque, which this test will pick up, is actually more dangerous because it's vulnerable. And what, by that, we mean that it's more likely to rupture, uh, causing the problems that we were just talking about. And Brigitte, so, you, you were an A once again on the report okay. card. None yeah. observed, none, okay. no plaques. And finally, percent stenosis or narrowing of the artery. Yeah, this is an important part of the test. And we can then realize that this person is at an early stage of heart disease. And we can then put them on a program to help reverse it and push them back towards A. And this is great takeaway for those of you at home. Heart disease, the number one killer of women. The number one killer of women, also the number one killer of men. And the reason that you do studies like this, if you are at risk, you need to talk with your doctor about getting studies done to figure out how bad your heart disease may be. Because believe it or not, you can reverse it with things like your diet. These are great foods, increasing your activity level, simple changes, lowering your blood pressure. These can all help you live a longer, happier, healthier life and reverse the damage of heart disease. Thank you so much, Dr. Claire. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Brigitte. Okay, so you saw there a uh, procedure being done with the HeartSmart IMT Plus. <clears throat> and what's important in there you heard him say at the beginning, he can know with a 95% assurity whether there's plaque in the coronary artery. So there's a big correlation between the this big carotid artery in the neck and the coronary or heart arteries. So we're actually getting a good scan of the coronary arteries when we do this. Now, as you saw on there also, they, they have this report card. It's basically like we received in school, A, B, C, D, et cetera. And it's easily understood. And they're looking at three areas we're going to look at. One is the, uh, up top is the thickness here of the artery wall. The second one down here is plaque. Do you have plaque? What type of plaque? How severe it is? And the third one is the stenosis or narrowing of that artery. Now we find when, you know, just human behavior, when we have a, a picture a representation of our disease process, we tend to have more compliance than when we are just told something that we may forget and we haven't written anything down. So we make sure everyone gets this, this picture report card to take home. Then we follow up with scans. We, most people, we try to do it every year. Some people maybe every two or three years, depending on their age and severity of disease. And we can follow their disease process, whether it's progressing, stabilizing, or reversing. Now, the first thing we looked at there was that intima media thickness. And this is just a picture representation of this. And you can see from a very thin artery as it moves along, it gets thicker and thicker. There's disease in the artery wall, the vessel lumen narrows, and there's a much higher risk to have an event such as a heart attack or stroke. Now, the value of having a carotid IMT, again, the IMT is that intima media, the inner and middle layer thickness of that artery wall that this provides information on your cardiovascular health not available through other imaging modalities. So as you saw in the video, it's simple, painless, no radiation, 
takes maybe 10 to 15 minutes, easily reproducible and very reliable results. Now, the Mayo Clinic in 2009 stated that a carotid IMT, that's what we were looking at, and that's what you see in the picture there. They're doing the, the carotid artery in the neck and they're looking at one thing they're looking at is the thickness. That evaluation can detect subclinical. So again, no symptoms, no history. It's not a clinically, uh, uh, it's not clinically present as far as we know. It can pick up subclinical vascular disease in young to middle-aged patients who have uh, a low FRS. And that's just what's called a Framingham risk score. And that's a score really based on uh, some cholesterol markers that was developed from uh, what's a very long-term study in Framingham, Massachusetts. So you can plug it in and say, my risk is such. So these are people who have a very low risk score. And then the CACS is a coronary artery calcium score of zero. And that's where they do a CT scan of the heart looking for calcium plaques. And they just grade this from zero to a thousand or more. So these people by all uh, measurements are exceedingly low risk with no disease, but a carotid IMT can actually detect vascular disease in these people, and then they can institute a treatment plan to stabilize it and reverse it. Uh, just for some more uh, validation of carotid IMT, American Heart Association in 2000 stated to recognize it for early detection of uh, cardiovascular disease and is endorsed by the American College of Cardiology. There's many peer-reviewed journal articles on this. Uh, as you can see, it was recommended in 2010 by uh, American Heart Association, American uh, College of Cardiology Foundation. So this is a, a well-researched, uh, uh, really steeped in science and provides you great information on cardiovascular disease at its earliest. Okay, what else? We said, well, it picks up plaque. Plaque now typically forms at the site of injury. Actually, the plaque is helping us. It's helping to repair this. It's like we got a, a break in the artery wall, and it's a little bit of plaster there to repair it. So the real problem was the injury, and it can be caused by many different things. Some of these are certainly smoking, high blood pressure, uh, nutrient deficiencies. We saw with the homocysteine, we need certain nutrients to... Uh, keep our chemistry uh, healthy. Uh, certainly diabetes and prediabetes, which is really epidemic. Stress, anxiety, depression, uh, sedentary lifestyles. You can add uh, sleep disorders. Uh, poor sleep is uh, uh, contributes to cardiovascular disease significantly. And uh, what, I, what I wanna say is here, it is not caused by high cholesterol, okay? And I know it's very difficult for people to accept this because we're just bombarded with this, but we do some uh, seminars in our clinic on um, low carbohydrate, high fat diets. And we talk about cholesterol and some of the lies that have been perpetrated really back from the fifties. But I'm here to tell you it's not caused by high cholesterol. You know, when there's been studies they've done, they say, well, in this plaque, there's cholesterol. And that's true. But it's like saying every time there's a fire here in Albuquerque, there's fire trucks there and saying, well, it must be the, the firemen are causing the fires. I mean, they're there because they're helping and cholesterol is there because it's helping. And I, I like to think of it as a sort of the Teflon pan example. And if you have a Teflon pan, you know, well, nothing will stick to it. Just think of it, the inside of your artery, things move along through there, whether you're cooking with fat, protein, carbohydrates, moves along. But when that Teflon pan, that lining gets uh, injured, we'll say, scratched through whatever mechanism, all of a sudden things start to stick there. And you can think of, they're actually trying to repair that area that's been damaged, but they stick there. And that's what happens in our artery wall, and we get plaque formation. Now, 
there's different types of plaque and it's really important to know this. And with the HeartSmart IMT Plus, we can know this. So plaques can be stable. And if you see on the left, this early plaque with a lipid or fatty pool underneath it. And then if you go further to the right up top and you see this plaque that formed and there's a very thick cap there right here sort of a calcified plaque with this debris under. It could be a lot of white blood cells and various uh, lipid debris. This is actually fairly stable, and it's what call, is called a hard plaque. And that uh, Think of it uh, as a callus on your hand. It's pretty stable. But then there can be plaques with thin fibrous caps, and they are very prone to rupture. And if we look at the bottom here, you see this very thin cap with all this rupture prone uh, and uh, material underneath. If it ruptures, we get, you see a thrombus here and a clot forms that can either block that artery off or it may travel downstream and cause a stroke or a heart attack. So having a thin cap or soft plaque, think of it like a blister, this is rupture prone, it can easily rupture, all right? Remember what I said before, think of plaque and inflammation. They rupture in the presence of inflammation. Now, there's uh, numerous soft plaque studies, but here's one that was done at the uh, heart, uh, Berkeley Heart Lab. They had 215 patients. Of these, there were 112 patients who had soft plaque, and 29 of them or actually 25%, that would be 25%, one fourth of them actually had a coronary event. That would be a heart attack. Now, 103 had no soft plaque and less than 4% of those had a coronary event. So it's still possible that a hard plaque would rupture, but it's far, far less likely. So it is important to know. And if we look at stroke, the same thing. In, in this group of patients, there were 11 strokes. 10 of the strokes, people had soft plaque. There was only one individual who had a stroke who did not have soft plaque. So 10 times more likely to have a stroke if you have soft plaque. Again, think back to Tim Russert. He didn't know it, but he had soft plaque and inflammation and he had a coronary event that was significant and he died at a young age. Now, I point this out here, IMT, that's what we're talking about is part of the HeartSmart IMT Plus. And then you may have heard of Doppler studies, actually they're very good. I used to have my, before we were doing the HeartSmart IMT Plus send patients for this. And a Doppler study they'll do at the hospital, very sophisticated tests, and they're really about flow is the blood flowing through this carotid artery. Now, we're not gonna see any impedance or blockage in the flow until the narrowing of that artery is more than 50%. So you've gotta have half of that blocked off before there is impedance or blockage in flow. Well, 68% of all heart attacks occur in patients with less than 50% blockage. So. We're missing most heart attack or most people who are at risk for a heart attack by just doing the Doppler study. Now, stenosis or this narrowing in the artery isn't considered clinically significant until the blockage is 75%. That's massive. Well, we know at 70%, patients can still pass a stress test on a treadmill. And remember again, Tim Russert, two weeks before he died, easily passed a treadmill stress test. So you can have 70% blockage in that artery and you won't have much problem getting through a treadmill stress test, okay? Well, we know 86%, nearly all of heart attacks occur in people with less than 70% blockage. So essentially what this is telling us that most heart attacks occur in people with so-called good blood flow. So we have to look elsewhere. We have to look at the thickness of our arteries. We have to look at, we have plaque. Is it hard plaque, soft plaque, or both? And we need to look at blood chemistry to see if we are inflamed, and if so, how badly inflamed. Now, 
this is interesting. This is from 19, uh, or is it 86, 87, in the New England Journal of Medicine, it was published. So this was uh, quite some time ago. And Glackoff's coronary remodeling hypothesis. And you can see here, he says, uh, as we get a normal vessel and we get some coronary artery disease, that's the CAD, and we get minimal coronary artery disease, the lumen, that pipe diameter stays the same. What happens, the vessel expands to maintain that. And we see we got thickening in the wall. So at this stage, I'm not going to see anything on a flow. I got great flow. But I'm going to see something in the thickening of this wall. And as we it, uh, progresses, it still expands. So the body is trying to do everything to maintain that. But we have very thick wall here. Now, Glackoff said, this is important because we don't have significant blockage in flow. What did we say? It's got to be 75% to be clinically significant. He said it's significant even at 5, 10, 15, 30%. Why? Down here. We can regress it. We can stabilize it and regress that. If we let this go to where we say, oh, now I'm having a lot of symptoms, really bad problem. Looks like I'm having a stroke. This expansion is overcome. The lumen collapses. We have severe coronary artery disease, and it's very unlikely that we are going to regress this. So we want to pick it up early. It's, I tell people, if you have 1% blockage, if you have just one one thousandth of a millimeter thickening, it's significant. Why? Because you can stabilize and regress this disease process so it doesn't come to bite you later on. Again, what do you want to remember? Take home inflammation plus plaque is a coronary event. You can easily find this out. Just think of uh, Tim Russert. He did not know this and should have known this. So I like to think of this in a cardiovascular triad, uh, evaluating the risk, and that's what we looked at. Blood chemistry, heart smart IMT plus with thickness of your artery wall, and uh, finding out if you have plaque and what type. Then we often talk with our patients on lifestyle. And last one is on electromagnetic frequency therapy. And I just briefly touch on all this. Um, uh, very big proponents here at expanding choices on low carb, high fat diet. I tell people whether you believe in vegetarianism, veganism, lacto ovo vegetarian, or you believe in Atkins, there is something all these diets agree on. No sugar at all, and you better be reading labels. No white flour products and no processed food. And I add in here, you need a cook. And I preferably tell people, you try to keep your carbohydrate intake at 50 grams or less per day. And I tell people with processed food, basically processed food has two ingredients, it, or food that is not processed, real food has two ingredients, the food itself and water. So these are, but the no sugar, no white flour products, no processed food are, they go with whatever dietary persuasion you may uh, be persuaded to pursue. Now, I'm very big into the low carb, high fat, because I think that's where the science is. I think that's where human physiology is. We do a three hour seminar in our clinic on this. We do that every month and teaching people about the science and physiology and the, the whys and wherefores of this. I'm just going to show you a few studies to show you there is a lot of good science. And this comes from 1991. It cost $700 million. This was not a small study. 50,000 women's followed for eight years, a long period of time. And they were testing the low-fat heart disease hypothesis. So people were randomized to various treatment groups, but there was a low-fat group. 20% fat, 65% carbs. I'm almost having chest pain thinking about that many carbs to ingest in a day. 65% of caloric intake from carbohydrates and a very low percentage from fat. What they found, the low, car, the low fat group had no reduction in heart disease, stroke, breast cancer, colon cancer, compared to a group on the usual 37% fat, which I would also say is still way too low in fat. But when they really dropped the fat down to 20%, they had no 
benefit from this. They found that a vigorously promoted low fat diet rich in complex carbs, fruits and vegetables didn't seem to be all that helpful after all. And there are some of the researchers in the low carb, high fat uh, realm said if in this arm, they had actually had a group on a true low carb, high fat diet. They felt you would have seen a huge reduction in uh, heart disease, stroke, breast cancer, et cetera. Well, we can look at some others about inflammation and saturated fat. How often have we heard the term artery clogging saturated fat? Um, nothing could be further from the truth. Here was a study. Uh, this was uh, done, I believe, by Jeff Volick. Uh, he's one of the big uh, researchers in low carb, high fat nutrition, uh, works with a lot of athletes. So a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, which would just be a really low carb. And here we're getting there. We got 60% of fat, only 12% of carb versus a low fat diet where they again had 24% fat. So a big difference in the fat and carbohydrates in these groups. And what did they find? Uh, this, uh, what they found was the uh, total saturated fatty acids in the blood and the inflammation. Here we come back to our friend inflammation we've been talking about. This was decreased in the very low carbohydrate ketogenic group. Whereas in the low fat diet, total saturated fat in the blood increase. This is important to know because it's been shown over and over and over. Yes, saturated fat can be a risk marker for cardiovascular risk. And it is the saturated fat in your blood, not the saturated fat you eat. And we know people who eat the most saturated fat and low carb will have the least amount of saturated fat in your blood. Whereas people who are eating the low fat, lower in saturated fat, they're having higher carb, they have a higher saturated fat in their blood. Well, if we needed more, here's 2014. So we went from 1991 to 2007. Here's 2014 in the journal PLOS One. Uh, again, it was Dr. Volick doubling the saturated fat in the diet does not increase saturated fat in the blood, which I think he already knew. I think he's getting tired of proving this. Uh, the new research links diabetes, heart disease, risk to diets high in carbohydrate, not fat. Okay. This is pretty well set in the literature. Now, stress reduction. So I tell people we need low carbohydrate, high fat diets. We teach them about this. And in my opinion, prefer, preferentially a ketogenic diet, because when our bodies run at ketones, that is the preferential fuel and there's an enormous amount of benefits. And we have patients who are in our uh, ketogenic program, and they will tell you this, uh, each and every one of them. Now, stress reduction. How do we do this? Well, we can exercise, breathing exercises, meditation, mindfulness, guided imagery. I think of heartfulness with HeartMath. Again, there's their website. Um, so a lot of different ways. I'm not saying there's only one way for all of us, but to... Take some time every day, even if it's just five minutes, to try to settle your nervous system, settle it down, can provide an enormous amount of benefits to your cardiovascular health and lower your risk. Okay, what about the electromagnetic frequency therapy? Uh, we here at Expanding Choices uh, are very uh, positive about this. We utilize it, advocate it to our patients. Uh, NASA did a study on pulse, that PEMS is pulsed electromagnetic frequency. They did a four-year study, so a rather long study on the efficacy of electromagnetic fields. And the history of electromagnetic therapy, where it was born out of, goes back to 200 BC. So this isn't new. Um, and you could look this up, the NASA study, uh, Thomas J. Goodwin, uh, on, on the internet and find this and read all about it. But basically what they found, they discovered the benefits of low frequency, low intensity, rapidly varying pulsed electromagnetic frequency includes what? 
better healing and regeneration of damaged or diseased tissue. Think of your heart. Greater cell longevity. Upregulation of genes related to collagen production. Again, very critical to, to our body's health. Improved cellular voltage. And we basically are, are electrical beings, and there's an electrical potential across our cells. And when you look just in a very young person, and then you look in an elderly diseased person, that potential across that voltage potential across cells really drops significantly. And we want to try to keep that optimal so our cellular health is optimal. And PEMF therapy can do that. And it was involved in cell restoration and growth. Okay. And here at uh, Expanding Choices, we've been, there's a lot of uh, PEMF devices on the market. They probably all have some value. We very much advocate and utilize the Beamer, B-E-M-E-R. You can certainly contact us. We'll be happy to send you a, a recorded webinar on this and a lot of printed uh, information on the Beamer. But one thing it does, and with the electromagnetic therapy, increase the vasomotion. And that's the movement, uh, the contraction, relaxation of the artery wall here. And you see in a young person, this happens 30 to 50 times every 10 minutes. Sick people, maybe as we get older, it drops down. It may go as low as one time every 10 minutes. And that means the heart is having to work a lot harder. With the electromagnetic frequency therapy, we can increase the vase of motion and, and it uh, provides us with what's called cardiac assistance or heart assistance, really taking the strain off on the heart safely and effectively with great science behind it. So what can this therapy do for you? Well, here it is. You get better nutrition, better oxygen supply, better blood flow, better cardiac function, uh, really can slow down the aging process and give you more life to your years. And just uh, as a note, uh, NASA, we talked about NASA and their study. They actually in 2015 signed an agreement with uh, Beamer and working with the astronauts, as you know, when astronauts go into space and leave the Earth's gravitational field, they're actually losing the magnetic therapy from the Earth that is so critical to our health. And another thing they lose is what's called the Schumann resonance, S-C-H-U-M-A-N-N. -N. You could look that up too if you needed more information. And during our uh, Beamer webinar, we talked more about that. But when they lose this Earth's magnetic field and the Schumann resonance, they tend to age really quickly. And by receiving this signal, many of these aging processes can be mitigated. So uh, uh, NASA did a lot of good research on electromagnetic therapy. Uh, Tesla, way back in the 1900s, was a big proponent of this for healing. And so we advocate all our patients to look into this and uh, use this as part of their treatment to help them prevent an event. Okay, so this is uh, comes to the conclusion of our prevent an event, the last heart attack. Again, here's our information. Uh, you see our phone number there. Below that is uh, you can email. We'll be happy to get you any more information, clarification on what we talked about tonight. Uh, anything that you would want concerning the low carbohydrate, high fat, or ketogenic diets, and anything on uh, the pulsed electromagnetic frequency therapy. So I really urge you to look into doing once a year even the necessary things, a uh, comprehensive blood chemistry panel to see if you can get a HeartSmart IMT+. Plus. Again, we do it here. If you're not in Albuquerque, we can try to help you find somewhere that does this. Uh, and you can prevent an event. So thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you taking your time out from your evening for this. Uh, there will be this recording on site. If you want to go back through it, uh, those of you who joined us tonight should get an email uh, so you can view the recording. And again, if you want a recording of our 
uh, Beamer presentation is called Healthy Aging with the Beamer or any information on low carbohydrate, high fat diets, please contact us. Thank you so much.